we are going to get back to the basics over the course of the next few nights together. We are going to go to the fundamental question of the Bible. It's a message that probably most of us in this room who I recognize have heard before. But as the old gospel hymn says, I love to tell the story. It will be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. And so tonight, tomorrow and Tuesday night, we're going to grapple with the question, have you been set free? Have you been set free? Free from what? Well, that is going to be our topic tonight as we break down this most important question. Have I been set free from what, Pastor? What do you mean when you say, have you been set free? Well, let's just start in the Gospel of John, chapter 8 and verse 34, where the Bible says, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, we know what a slave is. A slave is someone who is subject to a master. They are controlled by their master. They are property to their owner. They are domineered by someone else. They do not have freedom of their own. But they are the property and they are the servant of another. And the Bible says everyone who sins is a slave to sin. We are chained by it. We are shackled by it. We are bound by it. We are controlled by it. We are ruled by it. We are uh, subject to it. We belong to the kingdom of darkness. We are enslaved to our sin. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. But the question is, what is sin? Well, the Bible gives us the definition in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. Where the Bible says, everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness because sin is lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. We've all seen cowboy movies and heard about the outlaws. Those who are outside of the law. Those who practice lawlessness. But as we think about man's law and how it applies to be lawless, that is not exactly what it's talking about here. Because although man's law and God's law overlap most of the time, that is not always the case. When the Bible talks about lawlessness, it's not talking about worldly laws and crimes and misdemeanors and, and felonies. It's talking about God's law. And so lawlessness in the Bible is when we break God's law. When we break God's law, we have sinned. And when we sin, we have therefore become a slave to sin. And sin lords over us. When a person violates the Lord's commands, beloved, they sin and they become a slave to it. The word sin actually comes from archery. Bows and arrows. The word sin is what you refer to a shot that misses the target or misses the bullseye. Misses the mark. To sin is to miss the mark. And as sinners, we miss the mark. We, we don't keep, we don't obey, we don't follow the Lord's commandments. And we sin against Him. And as we practice lawlessness, beloved, we become a slave to our sin. Well, you say to yourself, well, who is guilty of sinning then? Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
all have sinned. Every person who has, is, or will ever live has sinned. They've broken God's law and therefore all have become slaves to sin. That includes you. That includes me. All have sinned. You don't believe me? Well, let's do a little experiment tonight. Let's do a little test tonight. Now, the Bible is full of different commands, things that we should do, things that we shouldn't do, but let's, let's just go to the ten most familiar. The basis upon which all of God's law is built. You've heard of them before. They're called the Ten Commandments. And let's just walk through these Ten Commandments and see how we measure up, shall we? The First Commandment and the Second Commandment I'm going to kind of consider them together because they deal with the same issue. In Exodus chapter 20, if you want to look, all of these commandments are listed. Here's the first of the Ten Commandments. It says, you shall have no gods before me. You shall have no other gods before me. And the second commandment is related to that, saying, you shall not make any idols. In other words, you shouldn't have an idol to replace me either. You shouldn't craft it, you shouldn't form it. Now, the underlying theme of these first two commandments, the most important of all the commandments, well, that's why they're at the beginning, is that God commands to be first place in our life. First place. To sit on the throne of our heart and to have lordship and dominion over us. God says you shall have no other gods before me. You shall worship no one else. You shall worship nothing else. You shall give nothing else priority over me in your life. And if you do so, you have missed the mark. You have sinned. Let me ask you a question. Can you honestly sit there tonight, either here or at home watching online, can I honestly stand before you tonight and tell you that God has always been first place in my life? Can I honestly tell you that even now, as a Christian, and in my case, even as a pastor of the church, that there are times when I take God off the throne of my heart and put something else there. Let's consider this for a moment. Suppose I was to ask you about the time that you spend. How much time do you spend each week doing the things of the Lord? How much time do you spend each week in Bible study? How much time do you spend each week in prayer? How much do you, time do you spend in fellowship with one another uh, as believers, as Christians? How much time do you spend e each week serving as a witness, proclaiming the good news of the gospel. If we were to look at your time, not that God demands all of your time be dedicated specifically to Him, but if we were to look at your time, would it be indicative of the fact that God is a priority in your life? Yes or no? If we were to look at your checkbook, oh, Pastor, we don't have checkbooks anymore. I know that's part of the problem, but that's a different sermon. If we were to look at your ledger today and look at how you spent the money that God blessed you with, by the way, would your expenditures be indicative of the fact that God is first place and that nothing else in your life is a priority over Him? Not entertainment. Not pleasure. Not substance abuse. Not anything else. That God has priority in your life. Now fortunately God doesn't demand all your money. But. Would your expenses show that he was a priority in your life? Can we honestly sit here tonight. And say that God is always first. I can't. I can. And that's just the first two commandments. Let's look at the third one. 
You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. That doesn't just mean cussing. That means using God's name, which is holy and honorable and worthy of all praise, using it flippantly, using it callously, using it carelessly. God's name is a holy, righteous, divine name, and it is worthy of our respect. And can any of us in this room say honestly that we have never used the Lord's name in vain? I can't. In fact, I would venture to say, though I can't remember specifically, but I would venture to say I've probably misused the Lord's name in the last week. Fourth commandment says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, we as Christians acknowledge the Sabbath day on the Lord's day, the first day of the week. I don't mean to shame anyone or guilt anyone, but how's your church attendance? Going to church isn't the only way to keep the Lord's day holy, by the way. We keep the Lord's day holy in other ways, too. By the way, we show reverence throughout the day in the things that we do and or not do during the day. But beloved, I would venture to say that all of us are guilty of not remembering the Sabbath day or honoring it or keeping it holy. Commandment number five, honor your father and mother. That doesn't necessarily mean that you always have to do what they tell you to do. Although when you're a child, typically that's a good idea. But even as an adult, we're called to honor our mother and father. To treat them with the due reverence and respect that they deserve because they are our parents. And God gave them to us. Have we always done that? Oh, and do you always honor me in every single thing that I say? No. No, but you know what? I didn't honor my dad in everything he said either. So don't blame yourself, brother. You know what? You and I are both guilty. We're all guilty. Number six, you shall not kill. Oh, finally we got to one that I haven't done. When the Bible says kill here, it's referring to you shall not murder. Killing someone in self-defense was allowed under the law. God called throughout the Old Testament his people to rise up and fight against their enemies. And there was obviously casualties involved in warfare. But this is talking about murder, premeditated murder, going out and killing someone. Finally, Pastor, you got the one that I haven't done. Well, maybe you have. Don't say that out loud. But I got bad news for you because you know what Jesus said in the Gospels? If you even think it in your mind, if you even call someone a fool, if you even, even if you, in your mind you want to, you get so angry that you want to kill someone then you've killed them in your mind. And you've violated this law. You have violated the commandment not to murder in your heart. I tell you what, all of us have gotten so angry at somebody that even though we may not have actually killed them, they're in the heat of the moment we wanted to. We thought about it. Number seven, you shall not steal. Well, maybe you've never stolen something big. Maybe you've never stolen a car. Maybe you've never stolen, uh, you know, uh, 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 expensive diamonds or jewelry. But I think probably all of us have stolen something in our lifetime. I have. When we were kids, you know, we'd sneak out of the store with uh, candy in our pocket or something. Perhaps we might take a pin from the bank <laughs> and not take it back. Well, it's theirs. It's not ours. Maybe they were giving it away. I'm, I'm, I'm cackling up here pretty good. Good day you fix it. Maybe what you steal wasn't a thing. Maybe what you stole, maybe what you stole was an idea. Now it's this side. <laughs> maybe what you stole was an answer off a test. You know, cheating is stealing. Maybe you stole an idea from someone so that you could get a promotion over them. Maybe you stole something intellectually. The fact of the matter is, we all steal. We've all stolen something 
whether tangible or intangible. Number eight, you shall not commit adultery. Again, this one may be one where some of us say, oh, I've not done that. I've been faithful to my spouse for all of our marriage. I have, I have never, ever cheated on them. But again, i got to burst your bubble. Because Jesus said in the New Testament that if you've even looked upon another a woman or ladies on another man lustfully with lustful and desiring eyes, then you have committed adultery in your heart. Beloved, I will tell you, we live in a world today where everywhere you look, there are images that evoke or try to evoke a lustful look. They're on social media, they're on TV, they've been in print for years and years and years. And every single one of us, if we're honest, at some point in our life, have lusted after someone or some, some other person. Number nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, meaning, frankly, you shall not lie about other people. But we've all lied. In fact, we still lie from time to time. We're all guilty of saying things that are not true, of misrepresenting the truth, of not saying the whole truth, but giving a partial truth to make ourselves look good or to keep us from saying something that would make us feel uncomfortable. But beloved, we have violated the commandment of God and we have borne false witness against our neighbor. Number 10, you shall not covet, meaning you shall not desire that which belongs to your neighbor. It's, there's nothing wrong with aspiring to achieve something that someone else has aspired if you do so honestly. But coveting is desiring to have, to take what is theirs. And I will tell you, this is one of those sins that social media has amplified. Because people go on their Facebook page or they go on their, their Instagram page and they see, oh, so-and-so is on vacation in Hawaii this week. And so-and-so just went to the Dallas Cowboy football game. I wish that I had that money. I wish that I had their car. I wish that I had their fame. I wish that I had their life. That's coveting somebody else. We need to learn to be content and satisfied with what gave us and make the most of it. And who knows, maybe if we start honoring God with our life, He'll begin to amplify our life as well. But perhaps in a different direction than materially. Here's my point, beloved. We've looked at the Ten Commandments. Just the Ten Commandments. And I would say that just by reviewing these ten, we have firmly established that every one of us has sinned. Amen? Amen? Amen. All of us have sinned. And all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. But you say, Pastor, some sinners are certainly worse than other sinners... Right? Some sinners are more vile and despicable than others. Surely there has to be some type of a, a, a difference for that, correct? But the Bible says in James 2, 10, For whoever keeps the whole law, yet stumbles on one point, one point, has become guilty of it all. You see, here's the reality. God is holy. When I say the word holy, you should hear the word whole in that. God is whole. He is completely perfect. There is no blemish. There is no stain. There is no sin. He is completely righteous. He is completely good. He is completely holy. His standard is perfection. And we, beloved, are unholy. We're sinners. 
And when it comes to holy and unholy, that's it. There's holy and there's unholy. It doesn't matter if we're 99% holy, we're still unholy. Or if we're 1% holy, we're still unholy. The only way to rise to the standard of God is holiness. And so, beloved, the result is the same. Whether we have committed only a few small sins or many major sins, the Bible teaches us that we all stand equally guilty before God. We are unholy. We've broken His law. And all of us, to some extent or another, are guilty. And therefore, again, we are all slaves to sin. And a slave, beloved, needs to be set free. So what is the eternal destiny of sinners? What is the outcome for those who are slaves to sin? Well, the Bible speaks to that as well. In Romans 6, 23, it says, The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. In Ezekiel 18 and verse 4, it says, The soul that sins shall die. When the Bible speaks about death, it has two different meanings. First of all, physical death. When we read about Adam and Eve in the garden, they lived perpetually. There's no telling how many years they lived. We don't know. But it wasn't until they broke God's law and sinned against Him that the aging process began. Because the soul that sins shall die. Physical death is a reality in humanity because of sin. The Bible says it's appointed once for men to die and afterward the judgment. So all of us, as the result of the sin of mankind, will die someday. Unless Jesus comes back first, we're all going to die at some point. But that is not the only type of death that the Bible is speaking about. The Bible also says that there is a spiritual death. A spiritual death. Yeah. Well, Pastor, what does that mean? <laughs> well, Ephesians 4 and verse 18 says, Sinners are excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. Let me read that first part again in case you missed it. Sinners are excluded from the life of God because of their sin. They're excluded. From him. Spiritual death refers to the separation of a person from God's goodness. It is an exclusion from his grace and his compassion and his mercy and his love. And his forgiveness. It is, it is an exclusion from the life that he gives. Those who have a severed relationship with God. As the result of their sin. Do not experience the goodness of God. Instead. They are under his judgment. And his wrath. You think that God doesn't have wrath. Well listen to this verse. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28. Scripture says, Do not be afraid of those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who could destroy both the body and the soul in hell. Amen. God can destroy both the body, physical death, and the soul, spiritual death, in hell. You say, Pastor, I don't believe in hell. I don't believe in a God that could that could make a place such as hell and, and consign sinners to hell. Well, listen to me. 
the Bible speaks about hell three times more than it speaks about heaven. And so if you do not believe in hell, you certainly can't believe in heaven either. Because the Bible has much more to say, and Jesus did a lot more teaching about hell than he did heaven. There has to be a place for those who die as slaves to sin to be separated from God's goodness and mercy. There has to be a location for that, and that place is hell. And the Bible says it very plainly and unapologetically. Hell is real. And sinners will be consigned to hell where they will be eternally separated from God. And hell will be a place of torment and punishment for those who have rejected the Lord. Now, hear me. Tonight, we have established clearly that all of us and all people who have ever lived past, present, future have sinned. We have established that all of us are guilty. There is none righteous, no, not one, the Bible says. And as a result, all of us are spiritually dead. Our relationship to God has been severed by our sin. We are separated from Him. We are separated from His goodness. We are separated from His grace. We are separated from His love, and we are destined in our own self to spend eternity in hell, excluded from the life that God offers. And to compound things and make it even worse, we are slaves to our sin, meaning that it has dominion over us, and in and of ourselves, we can do nothing about it, we are hopeless, we are helpless, we cannot run from it, we cannot overthrow it or overpower it, we cannot bribe it or pay it off, we can't do good deeds to work it off. We are sinners, hopeless and helpless, slaves to sin and need to be set free. Amen. And our only hope is that someone outside of ourselves Someone greater than ourself. Someone purer than ourself. Someone better than ourself could step in and liberate us from the enslavement of our sin and from the wages of our sin, which is death. Beloved, tonight I wanted to establish clearly and plainly that we are sinners. Because, my friend, the first step on the road to salvation is to admit that you are a sinner. The first step on the road to your liberation and freedom is to admit that you need to be liberated and set free. Until you come to the realization that you are hopelessly and helplessly lost, you can never truly see the need for a Savior. You might give it lip service. You might give it kind of a, a casual approach. But beloved, we need to get desperate. And we need to realize that we are broken. That we are in change. We are, in change, we are slaves. To our sin. Just like in Alcoholics Anonymous, you get up in front and you say, Hello, my name is so and so, and I'm an alcoholic. Beloved, we need to own the fact that my name is Russell Roberts, and I'm a sinner. That's who I am, it's who I've chosen to be. And as a result, I'm a slave to my sin. And I need someone to come and set me free. Amen. Have you been set free? Free from what? Free from sin. 
That's the issue at hand tonight. I hope that tomorrow night you'll be back. Because tomorrow we're going to talk about not what you need to be set free from, but how you can be set free from your sin. You're not going to want to miss that. I promise you. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for tonight. Lord, as we've spoken about sin, we've spoken about the tragic consequences of our sin, and we've come to the realization that all of us are sinners in need of a Savior. God, I pray that you would burden us. That you would burden us. Lord, not only to deal with our sin in our life, as we will discuss tomorrow night, but to tell others that we know that they too need to be set free. That they too need to be rescued, <laughs> ransomed and liberated from the bondage of sin in their lives. God, I pray, Lord, that you would go with us from this place tonight. Lord, bring us back here tomorrow night and use us in a profound way to reach this community for you that we might see revival break out here.